Hi, I'm Andre the Beast Creighton, and welcome to another episode on the Andre the Beast Creighton Show. You know, um, none of this stuff is rehearsed. And I think people ask me, uh, well, I had two people say, how do you do these shows? Like, do you um, write things down? Do you take crypt notes? And I'm always says no. I just kind of like fly by the seat of the pants because I like to use that creative side of me. And I have a tendency, if I write down too much information, I get a little bit crazy. Today, we're going to address a topic that... Um, we all suffer from um, addiction. I know what you're getting ready to say. I, Andre, I don't have an addiction problem. We all have some sort of addiction problem. Um, the unfortunate side of that is some of these addictions can be harmful to us, and we need to know how to recognize the signs of addiction, what addiction actually means, how to seek help, and more importantly, how to keep going once you've been recognized that you have these problems. Today, I have a very good friend, a leader in the community, a role model. You know, I can go on and on about this 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 man's skill sets. He is one of the leaders in the field of addiction. I'd like to welcome, without further ado, Dr. Jones. What's up, big guy? Hey, doing well, <laughs> doing well. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bailey. Good to be here. You know, we um, we talked briefly yesterday, because like I just said, I, don't, I didn't want to rehearse nothing, because you have a tendency when you rehearse, it doesn't come off authentically, and you really can't be creative with what you're trying to bring your point across. Give us, as a viewer, a little bit of who you are and, and uh, take us down what you do for a living. Well, I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm CEO of my own company, the Indiana Neuropsychiatric Institute. Okay. In terms of my academic background, I did my undergraduate work at Brown University and Lincoln University, Pennsylvania. Uh, I received my medical degree from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. I did my internship in emergency medicine at uh, Howard Hospital mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., and I completed my psychiatric residency with the New York Medical College. That's a serious journey. It has been. What made you decide to get into psychiatry? What was it that made you go down that road? That's funny because ever since I was a child, <laughs> it's it's laughable now, but literally people would just, you know, I'd be standing at a bus stop right, and people would start telling me their life story, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the point where it almost became embarrassing. Okay. You know, I'm like, why are, you, why are you telling me all this? I'm a little kid. Right. You know, uh, my sister used to tease me. If you remember the the old Peanuts cartoon, Psychiatric Help, Five Cents. Right. <laughs> you know, my sister used to <laughs> used to tease me about that. But uh, all kidding aside, I have always been fascinated by the mind. Okay. And that was really the the driving uh, impetus uh, to to training in psychiatry. But you got a legacy that goes far beyond the psychiatric realm. You have a family genealogy tree here that's very, very powerful in itself. The Blackburns. Take me down there. Being part of the Blackburn clan has been a tremendous blessing in my life. Um, most members of the community are familiar with Walter and Alpha Blackburn. Uh, my mother and Alpha are full sisters. Okay. Uh, and ironically enough, of eight siblings, Alpha and my mother are the most alike. Meaning? In terms of appearance, achievement, creativity, even their sense of humor mm -hmm. is, is very similar. <laughs> okay. We lost my mother in uh, 85, sadly, but... Uh, Alpha is almost like a second mother to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Walter and Walter's impact 
that he had on you as an individual moving forward, not so much the family, but clearly Walter has left a legacy here. He had helped restructure the city of Indianapolis during, a lot of people don't realize this, I was talking to Jason about this, during the 80s, Indianapolis had racial tension downtown where businesses were allowed to put signs in the uh, windows if you're black be out of town by sundown mm-hmm. so when Walter was offered I guess the opportunity to help revitalize the city with the Arch Garden um, me as an African American made me feel proud because mm-hmm. it made me realize that we have a strong leader in the the new Indiana, the new development, the new reconstruction. I didn't know Mr. Blackburn. I knew of him and his and his achievements. Him being your uncle, your bloodline, tell me the impact that he had on you. Simply stated, Walter was a giant of a man. Um, extraordinary intellect, uh, movie star good looks, and unlimited creativity. Okay. But aside from that, had a marvelous sense of humor, and he had that gift whereby everyone that he came in contact with felt uplifted right. by the experience. Black, white, yellow, didn't matter. Right. Everybody who knew him felt uplifted having been in his presence. And, and he, it, had that, he had that gift with people. How did it, what, what, what did it do to you as far as your career, helping you go down there? Because he passed at a young age. Unfortunately, yes. He passed in his early 60s uh, due to colon cancer. Okay, so how did that affect you moving forward? That's, you, that's, a, that's a great man. Yeah. As a child, we all looked up to Walter. I mean, this was just, you know, the the coolest <laughs> you know, baddest <laughs> superfly. <laughs> you know, that, that we could possibly imagine. Right. And and you know, we'd all look at him and, and say, Yeah, I want to be like that when I grow up. Right, right. You right. know. So um you know, I've been very blessed uh to come from a family of, of achievers. Okay. So there were there were certain certain things that were expected and nothing less would be acceptable. Did he tell you that, what he expected of you before his passing? No, it was... Or you just knew it by his achievements. Exactly. It was intrinsically understood, Mm -hmm. you know, that that nothing less than our very best would be acceptable. And one of the the most memorable things to me, and this is going back more decades than I care to remember, uh, when I graduated medical school, uh, Walter Alpha and the family uh, came down... To, to see me graduate. And nice. afterwards, we the entire family had dinner together. Mm-hmm. And at various points during dinner, and here I am, you know, sitting in the seat of honor, having just graduated, looking up and seeing Walter just smiling at me. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that he was proud of me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that is so memorable to me. Okay. And, and so meaningful to me that this man whom I admired all of my life, you know, was now proud of my achievement. Of your achievements. You you conquered everything that he knew you could go out there and get done. Yeah. Tell me about Alpha a little bit. I, I know the viewers are kind of wondering what's going on right now. What I'm trying to do is paint a family tree because it starts with the family tree. Mm-hmm. And out of this family tree, you know, the the blossoms begin to flourish. And then once we get done talking about the family tree and the origin that you come from, then we're going to get into exactly how the things that you've learned from being a doctor has impacted the uh, the masses. This is the Blackburn family. Tell me about Alpha. We believe me, I can do that show on my own. That's a, <laughs> that's a remarkable woman, fashion diva. Definitely, a, when I remember training her, <laughs> I said, Alpha, what is that outfit you got on? It's, I believe she designed her own workout <laughs> I, That wouldn't surprise me <laughs> at all. So tell me about, about Alpha. 
Alpha, simply stated, is a force of nature, a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> I mean, she's <laughs> astonishing. Uh, I don't know how uh, commonly known this is, but she had a talk show okay. here in Indianapolis uh, many years ago, well before there was Oprah. Right. <laughs> you know, well before there was whoever you might want to name. I've seen, seen that in her home, all the stars that she interviewed, and I was like, wow, you know, serious icon. She interviewed virtually every luminary that you could imagine. Even Barack Obama, president. No, Barack Obama came after her show. After her show? But uh, my family at large, my extended family, does have a relationship with Barack Obama. We're going to talk about that. That's okay. okay. <laughs> but okay. keep going. Um, Alpha, it, aside from penetrating intellect, uh, just extraordinary creativity. Right. If you've ever seen, and, and her, her degree is in uh, design, and if you've ever seen some of her creations, well, you have seen I have seen her it. creations. Yeah, 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 I've been there. At the uh, Blackburn <laughs> Scholarship right. dinner. Um, then you know how creative she is. And I can tell you that she can whip something up overnight. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and look like, you know, a million bucks. Right, right. So Alpha is another, much like Walter. I mean, they were, they were soulmates. Right. Um, much like Walter, everyone who meets Alpha feels uplifted right. by the experience. And the same thing is to say for, for her kids, Sydney and Kai, mm -hmm. and there's one more. Anthony. And Anthony. Mm -hmm. uh, truly, she uh, uh, has empowered them because they're doing extraordinary things as well for, for uh, the, the, the family legacy. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about Kai. Kai's my boy. Yeah, Kai is incredible. He's 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 twenty four seven. I say Kai, I gotta get you on show. He's like, Dre, man, I'm so busy. I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. You gotta go on there. But you can tell me about Kai. Tell me about Kai. Well, Kai is very much involved in real estate investment. Uh he too has a very creative streak, particularly particularly in terms of um visual arts. Right. So whether it's video, still photography, that's that's one of his passions. Okay, okay. Uh, Sydney has her uh, CPA. She's a certified public accountant. She's doing exceptionally well. Anthony is a chef. Making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm happy to say that, that everyone is doing well. Okay. So now we know a little bit about the, the family genealogy. Now you're off into doing what you're doing. Tell me about your road to helping people with addiction and what, you know, some of the things that people need to watch out for with addiction, just enlighten me a little bit. We talked a little bit yesterday, but tell me a little bit more. Going back to my early training even, which uh, again is decades ago, I'm very conversant with the different modes of detoxification Okay, from every addictive drug there is. Right. Uh, more recently, I've been able to apply that, uh, working with several clinics around the region. Okay. Uh, we talked briefly yesterday about opiates and some of the uh, techniques that can be used to palliate the effects of abrupt withdrawal from opiates, which is extremely difficult, what do you extremely find, painful. What do you find being one of the number one addictions right now that we're dealing with? The number one addiction? Right. Even though opiates gets the largest amount of no, press, notoriety. if you will, notoriety, well stated, um, I would guess that alcohol is still probably the number one most ad addictive drug. Really? That would be my guess. Okay. Yeah. What and that's, uh, I want to uh, qualify that. That's just one doctor's opinion. Right. So when you're talking about addiction and, and, and um, the alcohol, what makes alcohol to you, in your, in your opinion, mm -hmm. the number one so far versus the opiate? Because we talked about that. The, the, the young lady that goes viral and says the doctor prescribed me 
these pills and now mm-hmm. you know my life is completely changed. Is there a protocol to recognize addictive behavior before entering a hospital, before getting into surgery? Um, I know doctors don't have all the answers, but is there triggers that you see in people prior to this coming that, hold down, before I prescribe um, pain pills, before I prescribe this, before I do this, let me see if this person has an addictive trait? That's an excellent question because there is no predicting in advance who will become addicted and who will not. That's the danger of it. The only way to make sure that you don't get addicted is to never start. Okay. Because I have encountered people who, and yes, they might receive, say, opiate painkillers from a well-meaning physician. Right. You know, and they have legitimate pain, and they have no problem. Once the pain is gone, they stop using the opiate narcotics and go on about with their lives. On the other hand, I have literally encountered people who with the first dose, one dose, were like, where have you been all my life? One dose, and they were addicted. And there is absolutely no way to predict in advance who will become addicted and who won't. And a lot of people probably don't even realize that they are addicted because maybe the the brain senses a feel of relief, a sense of uh, euphoria. Uh, maybe they don't know that they're addicted, addicted to the product themselves. Is Do you find that to be another issue that people run into that say, I don't have a problem? That is very much, very much a problem. And, and part of the issue there, from a neuropsychiatric standpoint, one of the adverse effects of drugs is that it affects the frontal cortex of the brain. Now, the frontal cortex is involved in uh, intellect, mm-hmm. uh, impulse control, judgment. So it's ironic to me that the part of the brain is affected by drugs that would ordinarily tell you, gee, maybe I'm doing too much opiates. Mm-hmm. That very part of the brain that would warn you against a coming addiction is precisely the part of the brain that is damaged by addiction. What do you, what what is the protocol for that? What, let's say, for instance, when somebody recognizes that they have an addiction, and 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 I be a, we talked about this yesterday. I had a um, family member, um, well respected, and. Uh, I remember him reaching out to me and he was going from hospital to hospital to treat pain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, um, um, what, what seems to be the problem? He said, well, I can't get pain medicine for my, whatever the, the illness was. And then I got to thinking from, you know, not from a doctor's standpoint, but he's been given pain medicine since the seventies. So, Addiction and addiction has been around since the way before Vietnam, way before World War II. We physicians probably knew about it and probably didn't 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 maybe didn't have a re a cure for it. Addiction has literally been around since the dawn of man. Right. We talked a little bit about that. Quite (laughs) quite literally. But our concepts of addiction have changed over the years. Depending on the addiction? Not depending on the addiction. The concept of addiction in general. Okay. Okay. There was a time where cigarettes, nicotine, was not considered to be addictive. Until it became a problem. Well, it has always been a problem. But it was actually, cigarettes were at one time, this is hard to believe, and and many, many decades ago, well before uh, my time or your time, but cigarettes were actually prescribed by physicians to help someone to alleviate their anxiety, for example. There There were ads, magazine ads, showing doctors in white coats recommending a specific brand of cigarettes. So... Our concepts regarding addiction 
have changed over the years. We've learned much more about what addiction is, much more about what addiction does to the brain. And I'm very happy to say that the most progressive among us recognize that addiction is first and foremost a medical condition. It is not a weakness in character. It is not a flaw in one's personality. It is a medical condition that can affect anyone at any time during their lives. I can hear by the tone of your voice, and even when we talked yesterday, the passion is definitely there. Yeah. This seems to be an issue that, let me rephrase this, has it been addressed, and has it been addressed correctly in your viewpoint? At this point in time, I believe it is being addressed, and addressed correctly, as long as we apply the medical model of addiction. Again, if someone is addicted, or s someone that you love, okay, that person is not weak, that person is not flawed in character, that person is suffering from a medical condition that is eminently treatable. What do you mean when you say eminently treatable? Eminently uh, treatable. Um, there is help available for whatever your addiction may be. There is help available. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. We talked about the political and the bureaucratic side of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we touched on that. And I said, um, um, you got someone who don't have insurance that's addictive. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for help. And I was like, what alternatives do they have if they go to the doctor or, or whatever? And I said, the addiction usually when, when, when help is not available to them because they may not have the insurance capabilities and get turned away. Yeah. Um, the end result is usually more medication, a life of crime, the prison system, um, and hopefully treatment. But that's not, shouldn't be the path for everybody to, to go down to get help. What, what do you think about that? I think you've hit the nail on the head because unfortunately for many individuals, the only way of getting help is through the prison system. Now we and, and the prisons are full of people who have experienced addiction as well as other forms of mental uh, illnesses. You were saying um, um, God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. And naturally, nobody wants to go in and out of incarceration to, to get treatment. How big do you think it is globally right now, addiction? How, how, on, if you just had to guess, how big is this issue right now globally? Is it almost like a pandemic? Pandemic is an excellent word for it. Exact numbers are hard to come by because not everybody who is addicted will come forward right or you know or admit to it but to call it a pandemic is quite accurate in my opinion you was we let's go back to what we talked about when we was talking about leadership and people taking reckon recognition of what's going on and you said you work closely well let me not say closely you have addressed these issues with some of our political leaders such as Holcomb. Yes. And Holcomb was definitely behind addressing this even more so with the individuals that cannot afford the treatment necessary. Give me a little bit of insight on how, on that. I had the opportunity to speak with Governor Holcomb some months ago and I shared with him that I was doing work directly uh, to address the opioid crisis and he immediately was was paying attention. This was obviously something that was of deep concern to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and significantly enough, concerned from a humanitarian standpoint, but also concerned from the standpoint, how does this affect the state of Indiana? Right. You know, right. if people are addicted, what does this do to us economically? Right. You know, what are we, you know, how many people are we losing who would otherwise be productive, contributing members of society. Right. So he had a very broad vision, but it began with the humanitarian 
and then expanded from that point on. So he's doing his part in addressing this as far as you're concerned. Shortly after I had the discussion with Governor Holcomb, he did a statewide address okay. in which he spoke specifically to the opioid crisis. Wow. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you another question, too. Addiction. We're seeing tons of kids right now confused. They can't even go to their parents now. Yeah. And that's bad because yeah. I remember growing up, we played outside. We didn't want to come inside. Kids now have the World Wide Web to communicate with the masses, very easy access to to drugs, alcohol, a tornado spinning out of control. Have you addressed, witness, and treat situations like this? In a word, yes. How does it make you feel seeing the young youth of America going down that road? Well, it's, it's tragic and they're getting younger and younger. But what I would say to any parent listening who is concerned about their child and possible addiction is recognize first and foremost that the addiction to whatever it is is first and foremost a medical condition. Mm -hmm. And treat your child with the same compassion as if they came forward to you with another medical condition. Right. You know, whether it be COVID or depression or whatever it might be, whatever medical condition it might be, recognize that that addiction is a medical condition and can respond to medical intervention. We talked about this, <laughs> and I've, I've often, in my own state of mind, sometimes my mind wanders 24 7, but I'm always thinking. Um, we talked about genetic reprogramming. You said not in our generation, because I said I believe that we should have the ability to genetically hardwire that addictive behavior. What do you think about that? Addiction literally changes the genetic code, but medical science has not progressed to a point where we can actually alter the genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the, the, the best I could address it. Now, this will not happen in my lifetime. Right. Someday it may happen. We may actually be able to manipulate actual DNA. Right, right. The genome. Okay. I think the key is, in terms of genetics, the prevailing theory is that one will have the genetic predisposition to addiction and then through environment they are exposed to these toxins and that the combination of genetic predisposition and environment is what creates the addiction you know it's funny because there's all kind of addictions and i have an addiction it's kind of crazy i like to do what i like to work out every day mm -hmm. i have an addiction uh, is there bad parts to go with that? Yeah, I can get injured. Mm -hmm. uh, I can suffer from atrophy. There's all kind of things. So addiction on any level can be harmful and dangerous. With that said, you opened up a, some type of uh, um, treatment uh, facility f to address these things. Am I correct? More specifically, I've served as medical director for several addiction facilities. Okay. And mm -hmm. what exactly does those treatments do for individuals? Well, the first thing to do is to make sure that they detox safely. That is job number one. Okay. Because while detox from opiates, for example, will not necessarily kill you, it is intensely painful if it is not managed appropriately. I mean intensely painful, and that is the biggest obstacle to people getting help for opiates. So, like, what's the difference between that one and going into detoxing for uh, alcoholism? Because you can die from alcohol poisoning. You can die from alcohol poisoning, definitely, in the same way that one can overdose from opiates. Right. But alcohol 
Abrupt withdrawal from alcohol constitutes a medical emergency. Abrupt withdrawal from alcohol can and will kill you. And I'm talking about convulsions, seizures, death. Okay. I don't know how to put it any more succinctly than that, uh, other than to say I've seen it. You had a, you had a, you've always had that B state of mind. It's in your voice. Uh, it's in your actions. It's in what you do for the community. It's what you try to do outside the community. But you're still human. Yes. You're still human. And you shared that with me. And, and it, 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 it touched me because I, I, I've been knowing you. We, we've, we've been good friends for years. Years. And um, to, to know that even you had a weakness that tore you apart. Because naturally, we're in the public's eye all the time. We're role models to these people. Mm -hmm. You get close to these, 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 these patients. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment where you literally said, boom, I had to walk, I had to walk, because it got to you, correct? After being engaged for an extended period of time, I had to take a little time off. The, the burnout. The burnout, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. The, the burnout was just extraordinary. What do you mean um, like extraordinary? If you can imagine trying to hold back a tidal wave with a teaspoon, <laughs> you know, yeah, a tidal yeah. wave is rolling in. Right. You know, uh, more patients than you could possibly see. You know, and you're trying to to help. <laughs> you know, you're trying to hold back this tidal wave with a teaspoon. <laughs> you know, tossing. Were you, w w w did anybody come to your help? Did you did you reach out, or did you just say this is? That was one of the other reasons that the burnout was there because your voice, even though it was heard on a scale, the scale wasn't amplified big enough. No, I recognized the burnout and I knew what to do in order to, you know, heal myself. Right. But unfortunately, well, or fortunately, it required s taking a few steps back, you know, and saying, I have done what I can do without risking my own well-being. Right, right. Without risking my own wellness. And I took some time off. Did that, what did that do for you? It got me re-energized and ready to... That, that whole beast frame of mind re, <laughs> recharged itself. There you go, beast. I like <laughs> that. <laughs> so when it recharged itself, you actually went down a different revenue pass, working with the Department of Corrections. Yes, and, and interestingly enough, not entirely different. Uh, I have done extensive work uh, within the Department of Corrections, uh, working with uh, incarcerated individuals on their various mental health and addiction needs. So I have, and, and in some ways, you could almost call that my first love. Right. So I have returned to that, and I'm excited about it. Why is that your, why is that your first? You said that's, that's your first, because those people were at their end of their rope, and prison might have been the end of the journey? for them and you said okay I'm gonna bring my talents here because I know they can be productive citizens and I want to I know what the problem is I want to be able to address it this incarceration isn't the, 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 the end beat all you know Andre it goes back to something you were saying uh, just a little while ago for many people who do not have the resources unfortunately they end up incarcerated and that goes not only for addiction, but for people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, virtually any uh, uh, psychiatric condition that you can name. And without the resources, many of them end up incarcerated. So somebody's got to go into that environment. Somebody's got to provide them with the help in order to get their psychiatric condition, their addiction, under control is the state government local officials working strongly with your ideas or working with the prison system because a lot of people are like, well they're in prison they're criminals they shouldn't do this but statistics have shown that the majority of people that are incarcerated male and female even kids in juvenile detention are in there primarily for some type of addiction problem 
I, I wouldn't say the majority, but certainly addictions has a lot to do with it. Or the addiction got them to where they was at. Addictions is certainly a major contributing factor. In terms of the state's response to it, um, I would describe it as progressive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not perfect. But progressive. No, yeah. No, no system is perfect. Right. But progressive. The, the state actually spends... Uh, an extraordinary about a, amount of money uh, to ensure the the wellness psychiatrically and somatically to the incarcerated population. Have you found that a lot of a lot of the, the next generation moving forward? Do you find a lot more people now are working towards degrees and recognizing uh, mental illness and addiction behavior now? The, the students that are going to college now. You find an increase in enrollment and people wanting to get into your field? Uh, in terms of psychiatry? My daughter's going to, that's where she's, that's where her degree is in now, psychology, mm -hmm. psychiatry. Unfortunately, um, there is a shortage of psychiatrists across the entire nation. And why do you think that is? Because of the, 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 to avoid the burnout? There, no, no, because any medical specialty can result in burnout. Certainly economics has something to do with it. There are other medical specialties that are more lucrative. I, I, I used to joke, you know, I, I can pull an adolescent back from the brink of self-destruction and it's worth a few dollars. But damn, if I can increase their cup size, it's <laughs> a whole different story. It's worth it's worth thousands up front, <laughs> you know. So um, I, I say that facetiously, but there is some validity to it. Right. There there are other medical specialties that are certainly far more lucrative than that. Yeah, um, we talked about. You know, if, if I may expand on that. Go ahead. Go ahead. It takes a certain personality to do psychiatry. Right. Um, most of medical science is involved with very precision numbers. You know, if I'm an internist, and again, having done my early training in emergency medicine, if I need to know what's wrong, do you have an infection? I can take a, a blood count. Right check your white blood cells, and yes, you have an infection, no, you don't have an infection. Yes, you have inflammation, no, you don't have inflammation, and it's right there in black and white. Very concrete, very reassuring. Right. To do psychiatry involves, requires the ability to accept a certain degree of ambiguity, because there is no blood test, there is no scan Right. That will tell us, yes, this is addiction. No, this is not addiction. Yes, this is uh, schizophrenia. No, this is not schizophrenia. We simply don't have the technology yet. Okay. We will someday. But at this point, to be a psychiatrist requires the ability to accept a certain degree of ambiguity. And not everyone, you know, most medical facilities don't train that way. Right. Now we talked about we're talking about addiction and treatment and genetic hardwiring. Now the new ad I'm not even gonna call it addiction. Mm -hmm. The new choice of relief, marijuana, mm -hmm. the chronic. What what's your viewpoint on that? Marijuana is certainly not as dangerous as it has been portrayed over the decades. Okay. That said, marijuana is by no means a harmless or innocuous drug. Okay. Marijuana is directly associated with depression, anxiety, psychosis, mood swings, and a very recent study has established that marijuana is, in fact, a gateway drug leading to harder drugs. So trading in one for another. Trading in one for a harder drug. Graduating, if you will, mm -hmm. from marijuana to opiates, from marijuana to ecstasy. You know, the you know, 
far more toxic drugs than marijuana. This is a major topic right now, e- even in the political arena. So let me let me address this to you. You're a leader. You're 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 a public official, and and that's a major topic now. I mean, people everywhere wants it. They they want to use it. If you was in charge, what law would you make with that particular drug of that drug in general? Well, I think the the laws need to be more progressive. Even though marijuana has potential danger, it alcohol has potential danger. Uh, alcohol has. Mother against drunken driving said that. So you know, alcohol has substantial, substantial danger. Dangers. Yeah, to to the entire body, including the brain. Right. But whatever toxic effects marijuana may have, it is certainly not as toxic as being incarcerated. Right. You know, because at that point, your life is thrown away. Right. So now we're seeing a change. Uh, in policy, where predominantly African Americans spent decades behind bars for relatively minor infractions of marijuana laws. And people are beginning to recognize this is ridiculous, especially in an age where many states are completely legalizing it. Right. And a number of organizations are making a whole lot of money right. selling it legally. Right. So I don't in any way advocate the use of marijuana. Right. And I want to be very clear about that. But which is worse, using marijuana or being incarcerated for using marijuana? And obviously incarceration is far more destructive to a person's life than marijuana is. Wow, that's deep. Um, On a lighter note... You're happily married. Yes. How supportive? What, how, how has your wife changed your, you in, in, in your involvement? Because clearly you was doing a lot of things out there to change people's lives. Now she's in your life and she's changed you. Uh, did she come in during that time of that emotional breakdown or did, or did it happen after? There was a certain overlap. I mean, my wife and I have known each other 10, 12 years, okay. you know, before we sat down together and said, you know what, let's do this. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> we've been, let's, let's do this. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's been a blessing in my life uh, in, in every imaginable way. Uh, tremendously supportive, uh, tremendously committed uh, to our relationship, to our marriage. Um, yeah, I mean, one runs out of adjectives. Right. But to call it a blessing is an understatement. The people that you've helped over the years, is there one particular, is there one particular case that really stands out that that person or, or, those, or individuals that you came across to you and you was and and they really came to you with no hope because we all have that one particular client or two clients that you go wow that you made a major impact on can you remember a, a time when that happened with a particular person you don't have to mention their name yeah that's a great question and the answer is yes there are uh, a number of people whom I've had the privilege to treat who were able to as a result of treatment turn their lives around and go forth and achieve anything that anybody else can do. The thought that comes to mind is my work with young people, okay, children and adolescents, is probably the most gratifying for me. Why is that? Because children always have hope. You know, you know hope is a dangerous, dangerous word, too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if dangerous is the word that I would use. It depends on how you approach that word, hope, Mm -hmm. or or your actions towards hope. But go ahead, go ahead. I remember one instance where after getting a young person, getting their life turned around, back on track, a mother stood up at the end of the session 
and said, God bless you, Dr. Jones. You've given me my child back. Mm. And that was very that was very moving to me. That was profoundly moving. And I've been blessed to say that there have been many in, in, you know with with similar results. Mm -hmm. You have definitely <sighs> Jesus impacted. And you know I can tell how you impact people because every year this is the first year that Alpha did not have the all-white party. COVID-19. Ain't that crazy? Yeah. COVID-19. I, I was looking to see all of us decked out. I know. <laughs> I know. It's a, every, you know, the, the scholarship fund did not take place yeah. this summer. Uh, you know, the all-white party did not take place. All the things that I look forward to the most, you know, COVID just came in and said, nah, uh-uh. How, how has your life changed with all that? I mean, because these are things that we look forward to every year. Now life is re making us reevaluate, rethink, rebrand. It's it's just crazy. It's almost like we have ran off a of dull software. Now our whole body has to be recomputed, uh, reprogrammed. Now, how has that changed you? What have you noticed that you had to do differently during all this? To paraphrase, someone, I think it was Darwin. Survival does not necessarily go to the strongest. It does not, survival does not necessarily goes to the fittest. Survival goes to those who can adapt. Adapt. And that's the key. Except that this is reality. COVID-19 is real. I have lost personal friends that I've known for decades who were gone in days, literally days, from diagnosis to death three, four days. Again, friends that I've known for decades. So it is real, make no mistake. We are entering the age of the new normal. And all of us will either adapt or die. There's so no, there's no way around it. Survival goes to those who adapt, not the strongest, not the fittest, those who can adapt to change and accept the reality of it. COVID is real. The post-COVID world, nobody knows exactly what it's going to look like, but we can all agree it's going to be very different from how it used to be. How do you see things differently now from human identification? I don't like to use the word racism, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you the reason why. I, I don't use it on my on my podcast, and I try not to even use it in public, mm -hmm. because it, it, it makes people do like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a, it makes them afraid. So I use the word human identification. Mm -hmm. What have you seen change over the, in the last couple of months with this racial turmoil that we're dealing with? Let me address that from a psychiatric standpoint. I've been following very carefully the psychiatric effects of COVID-19 and the psychiatric effects of, uh, you know, lockdown and so forth. We've seen major increases in feelings of isolation. Mm -hmm. Some studies have reported that depression has tripled, tripled what it used to be. There was one article from a specific hospital that stated that in a four-week period, they saw more suicide attempts in four weeks than they had seen in an entire year. So these are some of the psychiatric effects that COVID has had and the lockdowns, so forth. You know, so astronomical rates of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation through the roof. And to compound it, people are scared to go out and get help because of COVID. Because they might think that something else is going to happen? Well, they're afraid to go out because COVID is out there. So they, they sit at home and suffer, sadly. Do you think that our leadership has, has um, taken a big enough stand in addressing the racial tension, the COVID-19, and the pandemics that we're dealing with right now, locally, not state worldwide. We're talking about just here in Indiana, where we live. 
more needs to be done to address the myriad health conditions afflicting the African-American community. Explain that. African-Americans are at higher rates for hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. Who's at greatest risk for contracting COVID? People with high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. And don't forget economics. Don't forget economics. Good point. Don't forget economics. That point is well taken. The have and the have nots. That point is well taken. So the African American community is already at greater risk due to pre existing conditions. Right. Combine that with COVID attacking precisely those individuals with pre existing conditions, and you have a recipe for disaster. Do you think we need to focus a lot more on our health care in Indiana? Oh, in general, everywhere. I mean, across the entire nation. That's and not only, not only our physical well-being, mental but too. our mental wellness. I think and that has been a huge part of my message throughout my entire career. I think we talked about that. Um, we, we're we're going to wrap up in a, in a little bit. But we talked about this. If you can get the mind right, the body usually recovers. Am I right or wrong on that? That is essentially correct. We used to think of the mind and body as being two separate entities and never the twain shall meet. Turns out it's exactly the opposite. The body affects the mind, but more specifically, the mind affects the body. Wow deeply, deeply put. I'm going to leave with this. If you can do three things mm. that can make a difference in somebody's life right now, share three things that you would with the viewers that can help them change their lives. This may get me into trouble, but go I'm going to say go it ahead. because I trouble. believe it to be true in my heart. Okay. The issue of attention deficit with hyperactivity disorder within the African-American community must be addressed. Explain that real briefly. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to see a researcher, a prominent researcher from Harvard, uh, who was the leading researcher in the nation on attention deficit with hyperactivity disorder. And I asked him specifically, what percentage of the incarcerated population suffers from ADHD? And without hesitation, he said, at least 50%. That's a high number. 50% is huge. Huge number. Huge. The statistics are unequivocal. If a child is suffering from ADHD and does not get help, definitive help, by age 15, they are at triple the risk of drug abuse, unwanted preg pregnancy and illicit activities. How, how do you recognize if your child I don't know if, if you can answer that but how do you how do you how can you how can the, the viewers know if their child or someone that they love is suffering from this? The schools are generally very good in recognizing it because the teachers are the ones who see it first. So what if, this, what if the teachers in general would rather shadow the situation. What do you mean shadow? Um, I don't want to get involved in it. In my experience, the teachers, when they recognize the, the ADHD, because it's usually disruptive, behavior. you know, part of, the, part of the problem is disruptive behavior, impulsive behavior, teachers recognize this and say, get this child tested and, and get some definitive treatment. Is there a treatment available for the child? Yes. Okay. Yes. Treatments that are well established, that are safe, and extraordinarily effective. What's the second thing you can share with the viewers? That was it. That was one, two, and three. That was one, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is, um, you know, <laughs> you know, if we was on the phone, we'd still be going at it. But <laughs> okay, I'll give you, I'll give you two. I'll, I'll give, give you the second two. one. I'll give you the second one. <laughs> Uh, and this is going back some years ago. 
I was addressing the NAACP in Fort Wayne. Okay. And using the resources of a, of a large pharmaceutical company, uh, had them do a search of all of the scientific literature that was specifically devoted to African Americans. Okay. And out of thousands of articles, this is a huge pharmaceutical company has access to all of the resources you could possibly imagine and they couldn't come up with a handful of studies that actually address the needs of the african-american community i'm speaking psychiatrically now the amazing thing is with as much as we go through as african-americans in this society the rate of depression is no higher than the average population. The rate of anxiety is no higher than the average population. But because we either are unable to get help or fail to avail ourselves of help when it's there, we are suffering disproportionately. So if you think something's wrong with one as an individual, your child, any loved one, Get evaluated. Get help. It's it's there. Do you find that African Americans? Are, let me rephrase this so I don't sound one-dimensional. People in general, mm -hmm. and it's usually on the economic economic stance part that because that's where most of your depression starts is probably the economic part because we want things and when we can't achieve things, the the spiral start to of, uh, uh, begin to un unravel. Baby needs shoes. I got to pay the rent. Blah 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 blah. Do you find that my no, uh, individuals are less likely to go to a therapist or address these mental issues firsthand? And because they're not addressed mentally, like me and you, if I can call you on the phone like we did yesterday, and we just talking, I feel a sense of relief. Mm -hmm. Do you find that most people need to start there first to have somebody to open up to and share these things? I would agree. In other words, keeping this, a lot of people keep the genie in the bottle and start to treat themselves to try to handle that genie in the bottle. Well, unfortunately, treating themselves often results in self-medication, using alcohol, using opiates, using marijuana, ecstasy, whatever's out there. So unfortunately, the pattern of self-medicating, when in point of fact, they are at, at the root of it, they are depressed. Unfortunately, that only exacerbates whatever is already there. Now, does socioeconomic deprivation uh, exacerbate all aspects of psychiatric health? Right. The answer is, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. But that is not necessarily cause and effect. Right. Sadly, as African Americans, we have failed to embrace the concept of mental wellness, that it is every bit as important as your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your brain is just as important and there is no shame these are medical conditions imminently treatable there was a reason that they said the mind is a terrible thing to waste <laughs> <laughs> that was my uncle really yeah chris edley the mind is a terrible thing to waste <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing it every single day seems like so with that said doc dr b how can people reach you? How can they reach you? I'll be candid. I am no longer available for individual consultation. Okay. Yeah. But you can recommend um, places and treatments maybe for these people to go to that may need some help because the viewers are listening. There's somebody out there right now that goes, okay, you shared all this beautiful information, but where where, do, where what should be my first stop i don't get on google and find places to receive mental health treatment 
Okay. I mean, it's just that simple. I, I really don't want to endorse uh, one over uh, the other, one organization or hospital over another. I can tell you uh, unequivocally, help is available. Help is available. With the touch of a button, click in mental yeah. health resources, they should be able to find somebody e to address Exactly, and somebody close by. Okay. Somebody close by. Again, I am no longer doing individual uh, consultations because I'm busier than an ugly stripper. <laughs> I already know. How long did it take me to get you on the phone? <laughs> Not what I tell you today. Man, you ain't, I can't never find you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working harder than, a, than an ugly stripper. <laughs> well, you know what? When, you, when you're working that much, you're already one step ahead of the game because your mind is constantly being utilized to some degree. So that's a good sign that you're, that you're busy like that. With that said, I'd like to uh, thank the viewers for watching another episode of the Andre the B Show. Doc, it's a pleasure having you here. Hopefully um, the uh, events that Alpha and your family legacy has will resurface or maybe we have to find a new way to adapt to get back together again and, and hanging out, but it's always a pleasure having you and speaking with you. Come back again on the show. With that said, this is Andre the Beast Creighton. Tune in for another show of Andre the Beast Show. Thanks.